Uh, Doug March from Built to Spill. It's going to be good to have you back in Australia. It wasn't, you know, I guess all that long ago, was it? I guess five or six years ago or seven or eight years ago. I don't know. Yeah, not too long ago. Well, you know, we had like this three-year gap where nothing ever happened. So we minus out the COVID years and it feels like you got back-to-back tours, doesn't it? Yes, a couple of years then, totally. With Built to Spill, I mean, we have quite a revolving lineup on this. The uh, the most recent album uh, with Melanie Radford and uh, Teresa on drums. Um, is that the band that will be coming to Australia? Yeah, well, that those two are coming to Australia, but those two are not the band on the record. The band is um, on the record is Leo Almeida and um, João Casés. They're from uh, Brazil. So what you do, you you have this revolving lineup, and you confuse me. Exactly. No, I'm confused too. No, we're all everyone's trying to figure it out. But right now, yeah, these two ladies haven't played on a record yet. They've been. We've made this record in 2019. We recorded the basic tracks and then worked on it for the next year and a half or whatever. And then Teresa and Mel have been playing live in the band for two years now, since the summer of 21. Wow. Okay. Uh, so it's going to be great to get you back down here again. And looking at the recent set lists, I mean, there seems to be this uh, revolving set list. I, I never seem to see the same set list twice. Is that how it works for Built to Spill? Yep, I make a set list every night. We know maybe 40, 45 songs, and every night I make a different set list. That's absolutely incredible. They, you know, like every time you bring somebody new into the band, then they must have to study for a year before they get to actually play live. Yeah, it's a bit. I feel like I feel like they kind of learn, and I've played with a few different lineups, and they it takes them a while to learn the first 10 or 12 songs that we play. And then once they kind of have gotten that far, they sort of start to learn like Scott's the the main drummer on most of the stuff. They start to kind of learn his tendencies and figure out kind of how he's doing stuff a little bit and maybe the same way a little bit with Brett. But, um, and then, and then I feel like once we've played for a while and we've gelled as a band, we can go back and learn other songs way quicker uh, with the actual opening song, that tends to change every night as well. Just looking back over the last month, Center of the Universe, The Plan, Fool's Gold, Going Against Your Mind, So, Going to Lose, uh, Stop the Show, I Would Hurt a Fly. Uh, you, we just don't know what we're going to get for that opening song, do we? Yeah, well, I feel like I feel like we've never had a hit or anything like that. And I don't know, I feel like... I feel like any of our songs can kind of, you know, I don't know. They're all, they all are just as important as each other, sort of, you know, none of them are that much more important than others. So we can play anything. But I guess that makes it special for uh, the person that comes along to the gig because they're getting something unique that night. They're going away knowing that no one else is ever going to see that show again. Totally. And I think it's every once in a while we'll play some weird song for our first song and, after the show, someone would be so excited. It's their favorite song. It was such a great way to start the show. So, you know, it's arbitrary, but it's, I, I like, you know, it's, it's fun to, it's it's fun to pick the order of the songs every night still. Mm. I think somewhere in the last couple of years, there was a 30th anniversary for this band that uh, ticked over. Does it, feel, does it feel like you've been doing this job for three decades? Um, sort of. I mean, sort of not and sort of, you know, you know how three decades feels. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I know it's uh, flown by for a <laughs> yeah as well as you. Uh, it all started out with uh, Brett Nelson and Ralph Utes, and uh, Brett stayed with you for quite some time. Ralph didn't uh, make it to the next album, uh, but at least you kept uh, one of the Uteses around. Yeah, you um, married your sister. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that 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 was a while. You kept the right Utes. <laughs> yeah no yeah ralph's ralph's no well, ralph's worth keeping too though yeah um with uh with karina your wife you've actually done some collaboration with her i think on untethered moon the uh one of one of the more recent albums well she wrote a little bit i wrote most of the lyrics she wrote it a little bit she's written lyrics throughout throughout our career here and there things 
you know, a few lines here and there. On, on my solo record, on my solo record, she probably wrote the most lyrics. Um, and then just a lot of like ideas about things and album covers and album titles and and just like a lot of advice about being, you know, being in a band. She, she's been, she's helped a lot throughout through the years for sure. So what was the the true wheel collaboration that you did with her? What was that all about? Oh, that was some of her poetry that um, we put to music. She just had a couple of friends of hers that she liked come over and play and record. And I recorded in my studio, and she did uh, spoke um, her poetry. It's like a ten minute long psychedelic thing. There've been like regular albums over the years, and then I think we got six years between "There Is No Enemy" and "Untethered Moon." Um, and then we went, uh, you know, from seven years from Untethered Moon uh, to when the Wind Forgets Your Name with the Daniel Johnson in there. But, you know, just mm -hmm. looking at the uh, the projection of Built to Spill albums, we're not going to get another Built to Spill album until 2030 <laughs> on, on that projection. You're probably right. Yeah, I don't I don't know at all. It feels like feels like the, those years pass by so quickly and I'm so busy all the time somehow. Um but, you know, there's enough built still records out there. Do you write all the time? No, uh, -uh no, I haven't written stuff in a while now. I I write, you know, at times I do. When I was younger, I wrote all the time. Over the years, I write a little bit less all the time. So, what prompts you to write then? Do you decide you're going to do an album and that that sets you off, or do you just get into the mood and out come a batch of songs and the album comes from that? Oh, it's a little bit of those things and other things. Sometimes you, uh, sometimes I'll work on stuff and um, just play guitar until I can come up with something. Sometimes I won't touch my guitar for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get working on stuff and I'll be really creative and working on a bunch of different songs at the same time. Um that's kind of how it mostly is. I guess I have all these songs that are in different stages of how written they are, you know, and then try to listen back to old voice memos of ideas that I've had and see if any of those are worth working on. Hmm. But I just don't work on music. I just haven't been writing very much as time goes on. I just, it's just a lot more work than it used to be or something. So the album, the songs of Daniel Johnson, uh, that sort of slotted in between the two most recent albums. Um, you know, I guess that would have been uh, obviously a labour of love because you had that uh, special moment where you got to play on those last two shows uh, mm -hmm. that he ever did before he passed away. Now, this album was released after um, Daniel had died. Did he ever get to hear any of the songs that you had recorded of his? Nope. Yeah, we did that like a year later after we played those shows with him. We recorded that record and we just kind of did it for fun to have our own versions of those songs because just the way we played them at practice and what they meant to us. And then, you know, we thought it turned out cool enough that it was worth releasing to the public. Yeah, I remember um, him being at South by Southwest. Look, uh, Last time I was there, it was probably about 12, 13 years ago. Um and, you know, when, you know, word that he was going to be performing there, I mean, it was uh, quite a reverend moment for for the crowd that sort of rippled through uh, all the attendees like a bit of a wow moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's legendary for sure. He's great. I'm a big, big fan for sure. I, I, I guess, what was it, uh, September 2010? I want to talk to you about that video you did, Hindsight, with uh, Bob Odenkirk. Mm -hmm. um, uh that must have been a bit of fun because I, I must yeah. admit I'm a bit of a bit of a fan of his television shows yeah me too um yeah we just met him he saw us play in Europe a long time ago and we met him a few years later and we were big fans of his when we met him and um he just offered to make us a video and he, he made a commercial for one of our records um I think yeah for that same record he made a commercial too it's, really funny and just did all that stuff for free just uh just because he's sweet and likes us so we were we were, we were very flattered to have bob odenkirk uh you know working with us at all
I'm glad he did it for free because I don't think anyone could afford his actual rate card. Yeah, nowadays especially, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was right before he blew up. He he was he was kind of a little bit on the lowdown in 2010. Yeah. And before Breaking Bad even. Correct, yeah. And it was his brother involved with the Simpsons? Mhm. Yeah, he's, he's an executive producer for 20 years or more. Wow. And you had something to do with The Simpsons on your first record. It was a bit of a sample of the first record. That's right. Every, everything's interconnected with you, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a small world in this punk rock and, and alternative comedy. Yeah, punk rock and alternative comedy. It sounds like it should be a television network, doesn't it? <laughs> That's probably a television network I would watch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tell me about Boise, Idaho, as a uh, as a music city. Uh, Commander Cody came out of there. Um, uh, Curtis Tigers, Elon Jewell. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's been uh, you know quite a few names that we know of on this side of the planet that have come from uh, Boise, Idaho, and it's quite a small place, isn't it? Yeah, there always has been a good music scene here. There's Caustic Resin and Braided Waves and um, French Tips, um, just to name a few um, great Boise bands from from the past and today. Is it a music community? Do you all know each other? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really tight knit. People are very supportive of each other, and it's multi generational. And um, and it's like there's a college here in Boise, but the music scene's independent of the school. The college doesn't really do much they the student body to to do much with music. It's all locals. And where does the uh, the the music scene sort of uh, take its cue from? Well, you know, I think today it's just everywhere. You know, I think that there's with obviously um, everyone has this internet access to all kinds of bands and genres and scenes. So, you know, I imagine. People are just influenced by all kinds of stuff. You know, there's a, Boise's always had a lot of like, a lot of venues. There's like you can go out almost any night and see music, and that's been that way for a long time. It's a lot of house, house venues and that kind of punk rock scene that's been going on for years and years and years. So there's just a lot of, I don't know, I don't, I don't know where that, you know. I mean, I have my own idea of like who started it in Boise and who carried it on and how it got to this point a little bit, but that's a little bit, you know, that's pretty deep into it. But I think there's some people that did some cool stuff back in the seventies and eighties that have, you know, that just slowly people have built on, on, on that and other people built on that until what we have today, which is a really vibrant music scene. We have a big giant music festival um, in the springtime called Tree Fort that has hundreds of bands from all over the world. Um, that's kind of the crowning achievement, I think, of the Boise music scene. And also uh, an amazing record store I've heard called Record Exchange. Um, For sure. Do you, do you visit that often? Uh, not anymore, but I grew up with it for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great record store for sure. We'll be seeing Built to Spill back in Australia in October uh, 2023. Uh, four shows in Melbourne, Doug. Four shows, three of which have already sold out. I know. I'm excited. It's really sweet to hear. Well, uh, good to see you back in Australia again for the uh, Built to Spill tour. And uh, again, congratulations on those Melbourne dates uh, because I'll be seeing you at one of them. Good. Thanks, Paul. Please hang up and try again.